Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess, and I'm here today with a friend of mine and someone who's been on before, Damien Blenkinsop from the Quantified Body uh, Podcast and also ketosource.co.uk. And Damien is possibly, well, in my life, in my world, he's definitely spent more on uh, quantifying himself than anyone else I've ever known. When I spoke to him last year, it was over £100,000. I think, and and it's been going strong since then. So God knows how much you spent now. But um, Damien, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you. It's great to be back. It's good to have you, and um, it's always good to watch what you've been up to and and some of the posts that you make on social media and how things change. And um, last year, I remember you starting to develop a product um, in the kind of keto supplement market. In the in the form of caprylic acid, right? C eight. Yep. And um, it's been a while coming, but there's been some good reason behind that. So, tell us a little bit about what you've been doing with it, and and why it's different. I know why it is, but I really want you to tell us what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it just took a, quite a long time to find. Uh, first of all, to delve into the issues behind it, um, like. You know, I knew there were different concerns and I did different interests and there were different assumptions from people and not all of it was necessarily backed up by research at the, at the time, right? So there, there were uh, people saying that caprylic acid was more efficient, more rapid in terms of generation of ketones in the body. Um, but when you dug into the research, it was difficult to find that stuff. Um, you know, so that was kind of part of the first uh, like stage of just looking into it. Um, now, fortunately, you know, someone just earlier in the year uh, clarified that question. They, you know, one of, one of the scientists, Stephen Cunan, uh, he's based in Canada. He's presented his work on it where he separated out the MCTs and he looked at the MCT oil and the coconut oil. He looked at all of these and he wanted to see what the impact was on plasma ketones. Um, so basically, that's the only study I, you know, I know of which actually tried to decipher that um, and answer it properly. Um, and so what he saw was basically that C8 is the one that's doing, doing, you know, raising ketones and that the C10 and the C12 aren't really doing much at all. And the coconut oil obviously isn't doing that much either. So the, the active ingredient, just when we're talking about increasing ketone levels, seems to be uh, the C8. And we probably, you know, we need more studies looking at the same subject to make sure that it's, you know, it's repeated and everything like that. Um, but you know, I was, I was glad to see that, that that was moving forward and there was more clarification on that point because it was something that I'd been trying to get real clarification on myself, um, you know, with using MCT oils. Mm. So, 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 sorry, Darren, so here, here's some anecdotal feedback from me. Yep. I know that when I use C8, yeah, um, I definitely see a, an increase in blood ketones and I see it about the same level as I do if I take ketone salts beta hydroxybutyrate right. yeah um it doesn't really uh the salts don't make it any better in other words so my my well the way i look at it is the salts cost a huge amount of money they right they do if you can get them right so it's about 90 pounds a tub or something like that right for 16 servings and the c8 is very affordable Okay, around that twenty pound mark, get the same benefit from it, and in actual fact, um, there's far more servings in a in a bottle of um, caprylic acid. Yep. Um, but here's the here's the other side of the argument: the ketone salts are going to afford me sixty calories. Yeah. The C8 is going to be about two hundred and sixty calories, and for people who are looking at um, keto from a weight loss point of view, they have got to be a aware that you know there's a trade-off and do not be fooled that if you eat fat you will burn fat it doesn't work yeah, like that, yeah exactly right? <laughs> and and that's what people are saying and i think there was something about the advertising of of ketones recently or this week or last week in the media where yeah. they were trying to stop them from basically saying exactly that you know if you're in ketosis you'll you will lose weight that's not necessarily the case. Well, yeah, I mean, this whole eat fat, burn fat thing has been going on for a long time. Massive over uh, simplification, which is really dangerous. And you see, obviously, a lot, a lot of the uh, 
multi-level marketing schemes. You, you hear this all the time. Um, that, that's basically the message that's being put across. And it's, it's unfortunate um, that it's just, you know, getting repeated and repeated because eventually the advert, you know, I don't know if it's actually been slammed down, but um, it is going to cause some problems for just the industry, for, for people selling, selling any supplements. Um, you know, advertising and, and things will get shut down. So I'm not surprised that, you know, basically from what I've seen the last year or so in terms of people's, you know, the blogs and, you know, all of these posts, there's hundreds and hundreds of blogs that have come up, you know, promoting this kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the typical message, isn't it? Eat fat, burn fat. Um, you can eat as much fat as you want yeah. and it makes no difference that's it. Um, because now you're a fat burner. And I get these questions, uh, you know, because I, I talk a lot to anyone who's buying the oil. I, I give them my phone number and my uh, email and they can ask any questions and so on. Um, and so I've learned a lot about the concerns just the last uh, six months and what they believe. And I can tell you, like, there's so many messages I get like, oh, so I understand now that I'm eating fat to burn fat. And, you know, it's 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 a uh, it's something really simple to remember, I guess. So mm. it really is one. I would say one of the s- strongest messages out there. Which is which stronger is than the, the, the science and all the other stuff out yeah. there. Which is, but it's wrong and it's misleading. And unfortunately, it's a like you say, it's a very simple thing to remember. And you know, from a I don't know, people think that I'm going to eat a high fat diet, and that's what makes you lose weight. And I think it, do you know what? It'd be a really good opportunity now for us to discuss actually what happens when someone's in ketosis. And yep. why they lose body fat. Um, so from your perspective, you know, I bought um, products from your website before. And I know that every time one of them gets delivered, there's a little letter in there from you that says, hi, listen, I've done this journey. I probably know more than most people. If you've got any questions, here's my telephone number. Here's my email address. Ring me. Let me know. And that I, I know, I've never got that from anyone else. Um, that's that's a commercial website. Obviously, if I do something with a friend, then yeah, they say, look, let me know. But yours is the only commercial website that I know of that actually gives direct access to you for yeah. for feedback, right? Yeah. So I let's say I come back to you and I say, right, Damien, I've bought the, uh, the capric acid and um, I'm drinking, you know, 25 mil every morning and I'm eating loads of fat, but I'm, I'm not losing weight. Why is that? Caloric load. You know, you just got to think about how much you're taking in. So some people will go overboard, right? So if you're just taking it once in the morning, I wouldn't say that's the issue. Uh, let, let's look at what else you're eating that day. Um, some people, they're taking it like four, five, six times a day. And then I'm like, you know, right. So the, the weight loss mechanism for this is that it, promotes satiety when when you increase ketones in your blood plasma which this does then you're going to feel more satiated less hungry and you're going to eat less and you're going to have a lower caloric load for the day and that is what leads to you know weight loss so if you've managed to boost up your caloric load um with this then the first thing to look at is what else are you eating during the day um now what, what I suggest with most people, just in terms of using it for weight loss, because uh, the first question is always like, all right, what, what are you using this for? Because people say like, oh, how do I use this? And I'm like, well, what, what is your goal? Because, you know, it really changes the game. Now, like, I actually do tell people who are on using it for weight loss um, to take it first thing in the morning. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, it takes about two hours to get into the, the, the bloodstream to the, to the top, the peak of the curve, right? So... At about two hours, two and a half hours, if you took it on empty stomach, it's going to be 0.8 millimolar. Um, but if you take it with some food, which a lot of people are doing, whether it's uh, you know the bulletproof coffee or whether you're taking it with your breakfast or whatever it is, then it's actually going to be lower because you know the other the other uh, substrates that you're taking are going to have an impact on that. So it really depends on what you're eating with it. But you know, so if you take it with something light, as light as possible, in an hour. Or, or two hours, you're going to feel more satiated, basically. So you're going to eat less. So people find that they eat less in the mornings if they take snacks typically or that they have less at lunchtime. So I'll tell people after that, if you are getting carb cravings, because a lot of these people, you know, they haven't done a ketogenic diet before, they're not used to ketosis and they're having difficulty with it, frankly. Um, 
So one of the things they're using it for is they're using it to kind of reduce their carb cravings. And so in that case, what I'm saying is like, okay, you're getting these carb cravings in the afternoons. What time is it roughly? Is it like 2 p.m.? Like most days, think about, you know, like your, your typical week. When are you normally having your snack? And most people like they've got a work routine or whatever it is. And they're like, yeah, you know, 2 p.m., I go down to the pret a manger or whatever I do, um, and I grab something extra, an extra sandwich because you know I'm I'm tanking in energy or I'm just carb craving or I'm just hungry, um, and I'll say okay, so try taking it an hour or two hours before that happens, so that you can preempt that, so that your 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 blood ketones have had time to get up there, and then you're going to feel satiated, and that seems to work, you know, for a lot of people. But so, so the first thing is like, are you getting carb cravings? Are you getting hungry? And then use it strategically before those times and say first thing in the morning because then you get the, fir the, first, um, the first bit knocked out. And then you should start reducing your calories. So that's, that's the first step in just like how to use it. But actually, if they're still having problems, like you say, I'm not losing weight, you have to start looking at exactly what they're eating you know, in those other meals. That's the only way to like, okay, what are, what are you eating at lunchtime? What are you eating in the evening? What, how, what time of night are you eating? These kind of questions. The, I think it's really important to make the point that it, if you're losing body fat, you need to be looking at a calorie deficit, no matter what diet you're doing. So if you're carb cycling, if you're eating a high carb, low fat version, whatever it is you want to do, the reason people find a ketogenic diet works reasonably well for them is that it stops the food cravings and the hunger cravings and the carb, obviously. Um, so by regulating your own intake of food, because you're not that hungry, like you say, it makes you very satiated, then you're automatically bringing in less calories. And initially, you will lose weight like that because a lot of inflammation will come down. You'll probably lose a lot of water weight and you, you'll still have your cognitive function about you because ketones are great for that. Whereas if you're on a low-fat, high-carbohydrate approach many people who have insulin issues or just don't deal with carbohydrate well tend to get inflamed throughout their body including in their brain and in their cognitive function and all that kind of stuff and um, and don't feel well on it at all and, and fall off the, the wagon really quickly um so it's interesting to know that we can use it strategically to prevent cravings and also to manage our um calorie intake if we take it in the morning, if we're intermittent fasting and all you're taking is 25 mils, say, which is a cap full, roughly. Um, no, actually, I think your cap's a little bit smaller, isn't it, on your bottle? Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, so I normally just tell people to take a tablespoon, which is 15 milliliters. Yeah, 15 uh, you know, some people will take tw 20 milliliters was in the last study I was telling you about with yeah. a 0 0.8 millimolar. Um, so that's a little bit more than a tablespoon. Okay, so but, so if they're intermittent fasting but they take it in the morning, mm. is that um, detrimental to autophagy and what they're trying to do from that point of view? Or will that still no, it doesn't. Out? Yeah, because of this, the kind of substrate it is, it doesn't necessarily interfere with the autophagy, which is mostly about the protein restriction, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's that. So if you're doing intermittent fasting and you have – low energy levels in the morning for whatever reason everyone's you know got a personal experience some people feel like that they're great in the morning um with intermittent fasting there's no need to add it um but some people do feel you know i get a lot of feedback from customers that they feel better when they when they're taking this with the intermittent fasting they feel more cognitively on yeah. you know i think and i think both of us have played around with this stuff for a long time and you know i take it every morning because it gives me a you know a better a better boost in the morning um personally um and that's you know the most important I feel like that's the most important part of the day to take it. Okay. What um, would be cautious or, or cautions that people should take when first starting to use something like this? Because, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a fat which has been isolated and it's being used for lots of health benefits, but not everybody takes the same sort of response to it. Yeah, like everyone is different. Uh, you know, that, that's that's what is really interesting about this. And, and it's one of the reasons I love to get all the calls and, and emails from people because there's so many different situations. And I got to tell you, like people are using these for a lot of different applications, of course, because the, the research is getting really interesting. You know, I was just at Metabolic uh, Therapeutics, uh, Dominic D'Agostino's uh, conference 
in uh, February, February, and it was it was fantastic. There were there were so many speakers on such a diverse uh, number of topics because these scientists from other areas are now coming in, like with with you know to treat gout and, and like to treat these different things because ketones have become interesting as a tool um, to all these people. So it's getting really interesting. So you get you know a lot of different people um, emailing you about this. <clears throat> And I've forgotten the question. This is uh... <laughs> so. What 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 should people be cautious of when starting to take it? Cautious. Well, the first thing we've spoken about is just you shouldn't be taking lots of this stuff because it's got calories in it. You know that th that's not the purpose of this. Um, like people have their gallbladders removed, so that's one of the things when when I I definitely you know kind of stress caution with taking. But because it's digested through the small intestine directly, people do seem to be okay with that. You know, um, the ones I've spoken to, they're very concerned about it, and I would be too. You know, if you've had the, that operation. But for the most part, I haven't like had any feedback that it's um, actually an issue. But still, I would go easy with it. Now, one of the the things about um, this oil is I was looking for something that was high purity. Um, I was looking for something that I could, um, provide a certificate of analysis yeah. out, out there on it and say, you know, this, this is high, high purity. And so you know what you're getting. Um, so that was one of the things that it took me quite a while to get to. And I eventually got the one, one we have right now is 99.3% pure. And then there's a tiny little bit of C8, uh, C10 in there. And then there's water and there's, um, there's not much else in there. There's a fair number of them on the market, which are, uh, 95%. Um, and then there's others which don't actually tell you what the purity levels are. Now, why do I think purity is interesting? A lot of people get gut issues with MCT oils. Um, and you know, there are many different MCT oils on the market. There's mixed ones with, you know, C10, C12, or just C10 and C8, um, and then different levels of purity. I and my experience with with this oil is that we get very very few people who are getting gut symptoms um, compared to those other oils, and uh, for that reason, we you know a lot of people are switching um, mm. to the, to this one. And I believe well, my, my assumption is, but I do not know how to how we can research this or um, re really dig into it because no one really knows exactly why people get these you know, loose stools issues or just you get a little bit of stomach ache and discomfort. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically there's, there's few people that get them, but that's not to say that no one gets these issues. Um, so I think that's due to the higher purity. I think there's some something in there, something in the, the rest of it, the 0.7% in my case, or, you know, the higher percentage, which we don't know what it is, and it's causing some issues. It's coming from either the process or it's coming from the original raw materials, which is coconut oil and palm oil. So, you know, that, that's the main thing. It, it's the gut tolerance of it. Um, and then for that reason, especially with people with chronic health issues, I still recommend that they start low uh, with, you know, a teaspoon or even like half a teaspoon. And some people do get gut issues with it. Um, and what I find is that they do have chronic health issues when I, when I investigate a bit more. And uh, one of the interesting things about the caprylic acid triglyceride is that it has an antimicrobial uh, benefit to it in that, in that it acts on yeast. And, you know, if there's one thing we know, I mean, you've done stool testing and, you know, I've done stool testing and, and all of these kind of tests, um, you know, and I've come back with yeast overgrowth. Uh, it's actually a relative, relatively common thing today. And I think based on the extent of that yeast overgrowth, when you, when you put some of this antimicrobial oil in, uh, then you're going to get a you know release of toxins uh, which can basically overflow your body's ability to deal with it, and that's when you get the gut tweaking and the loose stools and stuff. That's my assumption for those people with, with the chronic health issues because that they will still get that uh, with my oil as well. So I tell them to go low and slow, um, take it with food to start with, like solid foods, and then to slowly slowly build it up with the solid foods and. Um, Eventually, they can move to liquids, take it in a coffee or even an empty stomach, and then yeah. they won't have any issue. I think but it is the, about you know slow, taking it slow and easy. Uh, the the more chronic health issues, especially gut issues, you have. I, I think it's actually more common now with yeast mm. infections with people. Yeah. Um, and it's quite hard not to get it for a lot, for, especially for what they're exposed to, with what they're eating, and all the rest of it. And I changed from. A, well, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, I can mention it because it's my show. I can do what I like. So I went from Dave Asprey's Bulletproof stuff, 
which was the only one thing that was available really at the time to yours and definitely saw a difference. I was more tolerant to yours because I could take mm. more of it yeah. um, and not have the problem. But if you take too much of it and you're sensitive to it, you know, don't be too far away from a toilet because you are going to be using yeah. it pretty quickly. Um, but the tolerance seems to build up. So that's the first so, time. Right. That's the first time I've heard, you know, a, um, a reasoning behind what might be causing the problem. <clears throat> so if it's an antimicrobial and it's actually getting rid of some of the yeast that's causing the problem, then clearly your tolerance is improving because your yeast is being depleted and therefore you can take more of it. That's that's the idea, you know, and there's there's no research in this, but I can tell you the physicians who've been using this for a while, you can, you know, you can buy caprylic acid supplements, which are in yeah. the, uh, the gel or the gel form. Um, and those have been around a long, for a long time because a lot of functional medicine practitioners are using those for this specific reason, right? And they'll do it slow and easy as well. Yeah. And they'll build up the dose because they know they get symptoms otherwise. You know, so that that's where that kind of thinking came from. And I think I'd love to, you know, see someone test it somehow. Um, you know, you could have a study over, you know, a, a number of months and introduce it over time and then do the, I don't know, something like the Great Plains uh, organic acids test or something like that, where you can pick up yeasts uh, and their metabolites and, you know, see how it works over time and see, you know, and then test the gut tolerance uh, over time as well and map it to that. That'd be a really interesting study. Yeah. I'll, it'd be interesting to do also a, a blood test to see if people have got things like candida or some other sort of common yeast and the ones that don't show as positive, just basically to, to give them the dose and see how they react to it. And if they right, right, give them a full on dose, give them a yeah. 30 milliliter, give them a 30 or a 40 milliliter. Yeah. I know, I know some people buying the stuff are doing that. They're taking 40 milliliters uh, for performance, you know, reasons. Um, so, and they're not getting any issues. So yeah, it'd be, it'd be an easy, that would be an easier one, the one yeah. you propose. Yeah, just to like a binary one. So um, tell us about some of the, the uses that people are, that you're finding they're using it for, but also from the conference, what people were saying or, you know, alluding to that it could be useful for? Well, so it's, it's all across, it really is all across the spectrum. And there's, there's amazing patients out there, uh, you know, experimenting with this stuff, I would say. So I, there was one guy at the conference who had Parkinson's and was disabled in a wheelchair. And um, he'd been using the ketone salts and the, and the C8 and stuff. And he was standing asking questions. Wow. Uh, at the conference. So there's examples like that where, you know, people are doing, uh, patients are doing really kind of groundbreaking stuff, right? Um, there's a, there was a lot of um, cancer patients there, of course, because that's kind of uh, Dominic and Dr. Seyfried's Safer, area as well. Yeah. So there was a lot of cancer patients, epilepsy, of course, um, you know, and so it's not, and it's definitely not a 100% solution. Uh, but it, it does seem to be helping in a variety of areas. Uh, in my in my personal uh, case, I have high inflammation levels, so I use I, I use the ketones to basically uh, suppress my inflammation as being one of the tools that I picked up. And I get a lot of people asking me about this. Um, and you know, I avoid giving medical advice and stuff, but I do tell them about my. You know, I say I'm not a physician. Um, but this is what I'm personally doing, and these are the guys you should check, check out in terms of research. Volta Longo, um, Dixit, who did the NR, NLRP free uh, inflammasome uh, work, and looking at gout and things like that. And um, these guys are showing basically that you know to manage inflammation, you know something like a free millimolar level is is optimum. If you go higher, it may be too suppressive uh, of the immune system and you can get into problems. And, you know, as we were, I was telling you earlier, I've run into my own problems uh, with experimentation and pushing uh, my ketones too high. So the other interesting thing is that a lot of people have low ketones in the morning, even if they're on a ketogenic diet like, like ourselves. Yeah. Um, and that's true for me. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Rob Wolf on, on my podcast and he was talking about how type A people, like the more driven people in, you know, he's obviously seen, I love people who have seen a lot, a lot of people and have seen a lot of bits of data. You know, Rob Wolf is one of those guys. He's been working in this area for a long time and looking at lots of labs and so on. And, you know, he's seen like there's a lot of type A's basically who, you know, tend to have more uh, lower ketones in the morning 
and also higher glucose, you know, and mm. that's something that I see personally. I get this uh, basically curve in the morning. So I can't, I can't actually test or experiment on anything in the morning because my glucose is constantly moving and my ketones are moving in response to that glucose. So whenever I do tests, I have to do it in the afternoon because I know that's flat. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there where they have low ketones in the morning um, because of this. Um, so that's another one of the reasons it's beneficial to take yeah. a supplement, whether it's, you know, the C8 or the keto, um, the keto salts or whatever it is. It's going to be more interesting at that time in the morning to suppress inflammation. So I wake up and I'm all achy. I take my dose um, and it helps to even it out. Have you ever tried anything to manage that blood sugar? So either eating differently the night before or um, anything in the morning supplement wise or taking supplements the night before to try and make sure that the blood sugar doesn't go too high? I haven't, you know, I've, I've been playing around with the continuous glucose monitor for uh, about three or four months now, uh, pr uh, nearly, nearly the whole time. And I haven't had many days. <laughs> I tell you what does screw it up, um, sleep. It, when I when I have bad sleep, so that's something I was telling you I've been focusing on for a while now, and I'm literally going to bed before ten, um, as often. And I find it's the hour I get to bed which makes the most difference. Wow. So if I can get to bed before ten, I'm good. If I go to bed at eleven, I'm I'm not doing so good. So that has def that does seem to have uh, some impact on the variability of of that glucose spike in the morning. But otherwise, I would say well, I haven't really been able to identify anything. And I think I'm the problem is we're talking about like everyone's different. Yeah. And I definitely have a very, uh, I would say, slightly unusual biology because of my personal situation. So it's 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 definitely an N equals one for me. Um, and other people might find, you know, uh, something simple like, you know, some of the things that Tim Ferriss uh, proposed uh, in his four hour body or something like he proposed taking you know, like raw honey before you go to sleep in order to have a, a slower, you know, um, a flatter uh, blood sugar throughout the night. And maybe that prevents that rise in the morning. But if you look at my blood sugar, often often it's like flat throughout the night and it, it, it kind of kind of goes a little bit low, but it's kind of flat and then it rises in the morning when my cortisol rises. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's a response to my inflammation or if it's a response to, you know, just the way I'm wired. I've always been an early riser. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I don't, have you have you noticed anything about about your mornings specifically? Yeah. Or? So, so mine is is always on the high end in the morning, and I've done lots of stuff to change it. Is that the ketones or the glucose? The glucose. The glucose. Right? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The glucose. The ketones. If I wake up and my ketones are above zero point five, I'd be happy. Right? So right. they normally sit around that 0 0.3, 0 0.5 kind of mark. Um, the, but the, the, the interesting thing is this, this morning glucose where people are getting up saying, oh, mine's you know 4.2 and this, that, and the other. And mine are like between 5.2 and 6 maybe. Right? So they, right. Go, they, can, they can peak quite high on certain days. The average is about 5, 5.2. Mm. Um, and... I've tried, like you've done, you know, different um, sleeping times, um, different food prior to bed, uh, different macronutrient profiles, the whole thing. Um, the C8 helps, I must say, with it, if you're having it the previous, uh, the night before. And then things like berberine and alpha-lipoic acid and chromium and everything else to try and find a way of doing that. Tried metformin as well which makes a yep. huge difference because that will sort yep. it right out. Right? I haven't got a problem right. with it. If you, you take that twice a day, then you, you effectively are creating a completely different um, blood glucose level in your body. Um, at the moment, metformin has been seen as it has a lot of great benefits. It also has some side effects. So, you know, jury's out as to whether or not you'd want to put that into your daily routine or, 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 or a long-term supplement. But... Um, it's just another experiment that I try to see what, what changes things. Um, but I think a lot of it, in my opinion, uh, is reliant on liver health. Because if you've got any, you know, susceptibility to uh, fatty liver, or it's not quite 
um, functioning as it should. So if you if you weight train or you, you do any sort of quite intense training, you're going to push up liver enzyme numbers and it's going to look as though you're not very well from a liver perspective. I know if, if I stop training for a week and then take my blood test, my livers are absolutely normal. But that's not my life. I don't not train for a week. So while I'm training and my liver numbers are high, that definitely affects my blood sugar levels. My insulin, my HbA1c are all fine. But the the fasting glucose will go somewhere on the higher end. It's never really massive, you know, but it's definitely higher than majority of people. So I think liver's got a lot to do with it. Um, I also think yeast can have some, some influence on it. I know that times where... Uh, where I've had candida before, it's been worse. And when that's been cleared out, it's it stabilized a lot better. So there's so many different things. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, so a lot of the experimentation I've been doing with the continuous glucose monitor has been around fibers. Yeah. Um, because uh, I've been working on a bar, I think I told you. And, um, you know, fibers are one of the interesting ingredients. So as I was walking through them and testing other bars and stuff, um, basically a lot of, for me personally, a lot of fibers are very glycemic. glycemic. Yeah. So it's interesting because on, on, on packets of any foods you have these days, because fibers are all the rage, uh, you know, you don't have carbs, you have your net carbs because you've taken your fibers out. Um, but a lot of these fibers, especially the newer ones, because they're now making fibers for this purpose to increase dietary fibers so you can make the claims and everything, are glycemic. Mm-hmm. So, are they not carbs? <laughs> it's like um, they can so, actually push and, your and, they can actually push your reaction up more than than not having the the fiber in. I've had some like yeah. It, my, my, what, I got into this about three months ago testing the fibers, and I was shocked at first. There's one called polydextrose, yeah, which you'll find in a, a lot of uh, you know kind of snack bars and things like that. Mm. Like literally, I was up at nine millimolar. Uh, the other one was uh, glucose soluble fiber, which you'll see around. Um, and that's the same. And I, so I, well, I sourced those and I took them separately. So when you put them in the bar, if you put them with other things, you can reduce that glycemic impact. Um, but it's still having, uh, a glycemic impact, but, which but, is, but the point, the point of having them in there is not to have a glycemic impact. You don't want to, you don't want to put them in and then it's, have to manage their response. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I was confounded because. I made the assumption wrongly that these fibers, because they were in these bars, which were low carb and, you know, and so on, that they wouldn't be glycemic. Yeah. Um, and I actually started developing a bar with these on that assumption. And then I tested my bar, of course. I was like, what the hell? I might as well be eating, you know, a, 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 a standard bar yeah. like for this. So I had to completely revise my whole strategy and I had to like test everything. Um, to find some some new fibers that I could put in there, which were going to give it the kind of properties you want. You want it chewy and you know all of this kind of stuff. And it's 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 a little bit tricky. But there's also the fact that uh, based on Erin Segal's work, uh, when they've been looking at the microbiome, yeah. depending on your microbiome, you're going to digest not not just fibers, but you know carbs and fats differently and how they go together. So it could be that. I'm a highly glycemic reactor to fibers. However, that's not true because Rob Wolf, you know, in Rob Wolf's new book, he had this seven day carb test. So when I had him on my show, I, before I had him on the show, I did, I went through a bunch of, you know, fibers, uh, sorry, uh, different carbs, 50 grams. You take 50 grams equivalent of carbs for, for each one, like black beans, pinto beans, rice, um, and, and lentils and so on. And I tested all of those and, you know, I think my blood glucose response was better than most most people. I've been on a ketogenic diet for a while now, so I wasn't surprised. I do have inflammation, so I thought it would be worse. But then one of them was a standout, which was rice, just mm-hmm. white rice. I was like, Shh. after two hours, it wasn't even coming down. It was still growing still up. up. Yeah. You know, after two hours, it's supposed to come back down and, and below the 115 milligram per deciliter. Um, but mine was still going up. And uh, another fiber, for instance, lentils hardly had an impact on me. I think it went up 10 milligrams uh, per deciliter and it went back down, you know, within like an hour or so. And so I could apparently eat, uh, you know, lentils and pretty much stay ketogenic. Mm. Um, although it did give me gut symptoms. So yeah. uh, I don't know. So I think it's, it's, it's like everyone is different. 
uh, that that's that's a real issue, and it's interesting for food claims going forward because you they they look at averages and they're like, on average, you're not going to get much of a glycemic response from this, but in particular, the piece, people who are insulin resistant and the people who are more likely to be eating these things, you know, you really need to test on the group of people who are going to be consuming this, you know, are, and um, if you are insulin resistant, if you've got a bit of metabolic syndrome, you're a bit overweight and you're eating these things for weight loss, then we better hope that, you know, they've been tested on that a cohort of people who are similar to that, because if you test them on healthy people, they may get no glycemic response at all. And it's not an issue. Um, but for these people, I think it's more likely. So I'm, I'm interested in doing a study on this, actually insulin sensitivity versus ketogenic foods. Like, um, is a, is a response going to vary based on how insulin sensitive you are? Mm. And for some people, a ketogenic food, which could be like a five, one ratio or so, you know, five parts uh, fat and one part protein and carbs combined. Uh, which of course doesn't acknowledge the issue with the fiber, which is some of its, you know, carb anyway. Um, how, how's that going to work? Is that going to work for everyone? I don't think so. I think some people maybe think there's a six to one ratio. Who knows? It's all individual. That's the problem. You know, mm -hmm. unless we find out for ourselves what works and what doesn't, which is why Rob did that test in that book, find out your own thing. Um, it's very difficult to make something that's going to work generally throughout the population. I think, Knowing how to use them and why you're using both the C8 and a bar, I think that's key to it. People, yeah. you know, don't guzzle down tons of C8 thinking you're going to lose weight, but do be aware, and this is why I use it, I think from a health perspective, it's got some great um, benefits, not only from a cognitive function, so you can think a little bit better, a bit more energy, um, better ketones, reduced inflammation, but also from the antimicrobial gut health point of view, you know, keep yeast down, you know, mold maybe, prevent that a little bit better. Um, it, it's got a lot of different benefits to it. And unlike uh, some sort of powdered superfood that you can buy and put into a shake, the, the energetics of it are still there. Whereas the dried out, you know, old powder that you've got in a, in a tub that tastes like grass, um, some of it isn't quite as beneficial as it was when it was fresh. Right, yeah, there's that too. Um, so for anybody that's wanting to um, think about using C8, what would be, in your mind, the top benefits for it? Why would someone want to put it into their regime at all? Well, so there's the weight loss, obviously. I, I can tell you what people use it for because yeah. I know my customer base um, pretty well. Weight loss is one of the main ones, uh, the hunger mechanism we were talking about. Yeah. Um, and just to be conscious of, of that, you know, the, the best way to use it, if you're conscious of this hunger mechanism, is it working for you? Is it not? Uh, if, if it's not, ask, ask me or someone else, like, why isn't this working for me? What am I doing wrong? Um, but it should basically satiate hunger, reduce your caloric load throughout the day, and thus lead to weight loss. Uh, the next bit is uh, cognitive performance. I have to say there's a lot of high-driven executives which are using this. Um, to keep them going throughout the day um, and you know that, that's that's then there's I'd say like people at the gym are using it especially people on ketogenic diets um, to give themselves a bit of boost there uh, some people are using it for intermittent fasting to make it easier or uh, for fasting uh, prolonged fasts you know when they're doing that for a few days or so then you have people who are using it for medical uses uh, or let's say therapeutic uses uh, so they're increasing their ketones to reduce inflammation neuroinflammation, um, so there, you know, it's things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, and obviously there's just research going on in these areas, uh, but these people, they want to push the edge. Uh, I have to say a lot of the time it is the daughters and sons of people who have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's who mm. are the ones buying it, and which I guess just makes sense because, you know, older people probably aren't reading up on this stuff uh, and not used to I know my parents don't really... Uh, read up on this stuff so it just kind of makes sense it's more people in their 30s and 40s who are proposing it to uh, people in their 50s 60s who are starting to suffer from these kind of conditions um, you know and so yeah I mean that, that that's 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 everything I, I think that people are using it's it pretty, for and it's a pretty wide range of benefits yeah right? it, also, it is and I think you know there's a lot of research going on like I said in different areas yeah. and it's going to be really interesting to see what else comes um, up? where it ends up and then of course there's cancer um, people are using it for cancer as well. 
So uh, wait, let's, I want to go back to the Alzheimer's quickly. And yeah. um, is there a particular dosage or way of using it, or is it just the same as anybody else? Just take a small amount in the morning, maybe some more later on in the day, so that it just gets that synaptic um, messaging working a little bit better, or is there some other way of using it? I don't think there's really studies to show this yet. So I would follow Stephen Kunan's work. He's looking at brain metabolism. Um, so always go back and read the research. What we're doing at the moment is, you know, we're making best guesses based on research and N equals one experimentation. It's definitely not like best practice or anything, but people are don't want to wait, obviously. You know, um, I have... Uh, uh, brain damage myself actually from from the infections that I I have I've got documented um, issues and I'm so I'm you know taking it to an extent to reduce neuroinflammation to repair to allow myself to my body to repair and reduce that atrophy atrophy and things like that um, so we'll see how that works out when I quantify it again to see you know what the progress has been but I'm also doing other things so it's a bit um, difficult to just say oh it's just one thing it's a C8 or whatever it is but um, I would say just you know based on my own experience and this is primarily just like how I feel um, and you know what seems to keep me in line is 1.5 millimolar to 3 millimolar if you stay in that zone maybe I feel better at 2.5 um, so somewhere somewhere like that and I'm operating better um, but it's like n equals you know it is n equals one experimentation I would just because we don't know what Alzheimer's is as well you know yeah. I'm definitely not the person I, th I think and a really interesting guy to follow on this is Dale Bredesen who's uh, looking at things like the ketogenic diet and, and many other things. Uh, he's putting them together into a, basically a stack of treatments. Um, and he's using a lot of biomarkers to, to tell which ones you should use. So for Alzheimer's, have a look into his work. Um, and he is using things like MCTs and um, things like that to manage the condition. So he'd be the one to, to follow on that. But, okay. you know, I think a good start is, you know, two millimolar to give you, your brain a chance to experiment with using the, the ketones um, as, as fuel to see if you do better on that. But I do think you need to do a clear, so you probably want to take a double dose of the C8 oil, uh, for this reason, or maybe even a triple dose to try and see the difference. So this is what I recommend to people where they're trying to experiment with this stuff. If they're not on a ketogenic diet, so we can basically assume they're, you know, their ketones are zero, 0 0.3, 0 0.1, whatever it is. Um, they, and then use going to do an experiment with their parents on this or whoever it is, that they really want to have a week or something where they're doing a very different change. Um, so, like, bump your ketones up. Don't just take the, the the small dose, which some people will be taking, and they're getting, like, a 0 0.3, a 0 0.4. Worse if they're taking it with meals. We don't know what they, they're getting unless you're testing, and they should be testing if they're doing it for something serious like this. Um, but, you know, take a high dose. See if they can tolerate a high dose, and do that for seven days. And then compare their cognitive performance, over, you know, towards the end of that week compared to where they were before. And that's when you might see that there's actually a difference or not. So, I've, so I'm a believer in like trying to do it a lot a heavier test because it's not going to harm you. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with having ketones of two or three. If you have a gut issue, you might have that issue. So they got to test with that. But I think that would be interesting for someone as a test to see if it's going to be beneficial yeah. to them. And um, when it comes to cancer... What are the protocols that people are using for that at the moment? Same sort of thing? I don't know. You know, I, I do try to stay a little bit away from that because it's such a contentious yeah. uh, topic. Uh, I think, you we're, know, by Andrew, the way, I just, Scar just, we, I just want to make people sure, make them understand that we are not saying it is a cure for cancer, right? Because it's not. <laughs> not. Um, yeah. But I would always, I would always say, like, it. follow the people who are doing the work on a subject yeah. um, and, the, and the things that they're doing. You know, so Thomas Seafried mentioned earlier, uh, Dominic, Dominic D'Agostino, there's a guy in the UK, Andrew Scarborough, who's managed his own yeah. tumor. Uh, I think you know Andrew as well. Yeah. Um, you know, um, so you know, I think you know, you can find Andrew on, on media and, and so on and follow these kind of people. They're going to be a lot more up to speed. Andrew's actually studying uh, cancer metabolism and, and, and stuff now. Um, you know, he's basically had to, you know, he was his own experiment and now he's like, you know, studying it and trying to understand it and, and going through all the labs and everything on his own tumor, which is really interesting for him. Um, but, you know, these kind of people will definitely be way more up to speed uh, than me. So um, overall, I find it a great product and the fact that it has a um, testing process behind it, which gives us the purity and the certificate of each batch, I think 
is is the only one that does it, right? I think. Yeah, I don't think I have seen another certificate of analysis. Yeah. I, I think I think you're right. We're just. I think I told you we're just about to bump it up to ninety nine point six percent. So I, it's going to be interesting if people notice the difference from that. Right. Uh, in terms, or, or I don't know if, if spontaneously gut issues completely disappear or something. I don't know. Interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll have to get another one in and then compare it to the one that I've got currently and uh, see what changes it's made. Um, mm. So yeah, if anyone wants it, they can come to your site ketosource.co.uk or they can go to my site athleticnutrition.tv there's a link to it there just click on it um and i would certainly give it a go if you don't already it's something that i've been wanting to speak about for well since you started bringing this out a little while ago and and i know you were a little bit reluctant to do it because it wasn't quite where you wanted it at the time and um and that's the one thing about you and what you do is that you spend a lot of time money and effort making sure it's exactly as you want it so that's great, and that's why I've got the patience to wait the year to get you back on and say, right, let's talk about it now. Um, and I'm also interested in the bars, so if you can get me hold of some of those. You're, so, you'll be on the beta test program for sure, man. Yeah, you're awful. gonna get some. I'm so I'm, I'm nearly finished. Uh, like I has, it's been a lot longer than I thought it would because there was quite a few hiccups with fibers and stuff, but um, I don't know, I don't know. Give me some quick feedback. Peppermint, choc- chocolate, choc- mint. Uh, caramel, uh, chocolate caramel, and uh, cookies and cream. How does that sound? They sound fine. Yeah. Yeah, one of each. Great. Bring it. Let's have a go. Um, that's, that's, they're, a, they're that's the last step. So in a couple of weeks, I'll send you some. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and then finally, there's also um, a little meet that you've put together recently, a meet up. Um, and I haven't been able to attend it as yet because I fall on a Wednesday generally and I can't normally... Um, get into town on Wednesday evening. Tell us a bit about that, why you did it and what's been going on because it's, it's had a bit of traction and it's got quite popular. Oh yeah, I drink, was right? really uh, um, quite amazed. So I went to the Metabolic Therapeutics uh, in February and it was it was apparently double the size from the year before uh, the conference. And I was like I was saying, there's so many great researchers out there. A lot of people I've been following for a long time, like Walter Longer, like everyone was there. It was just amazing. Jeff Olek, um, you know, and just lots of interesting stuff and a lot of enthusiasm for the whole area, you know, and I realized this is, it's a really, really interesting area of research. Ketones are this potential amazing tool and th- there must be some downsides, you know, there's, you know, it's, it's like, it, it can't, it's got being looked at for so many uses. So, so I just saw there was so much excitement over there in the U S and it wasn't quite, uh, there in London or the, or the UK yet, right? we I think we're always kind of at a lag there. And I just noticed that there was this, like, you know, there's huge enthusiasm around it and also the science was making good progress. So I got back and I said, okay, let's see if there's, you know, a lot of keto interested people here in uh, London Um, and started up a group. And I think there's like 170 people signed up. But uh, the first meetup we had, there were, I think, I think it was 40 people uh, or about around 40 people, maybe 35, 40 people turned up. Um, And again, just the enthusiasm from people and the range, like we've been talking today, the range of different applications. There's, of course, a lot of people who've used it for weight loss. Um, there's a lot of people interested in it for cognitive performance or getting ripped, uh, more like the keto gain style. Um, and then uh, Alzheimer's, the, again, daughters and, and sons of people with uh, conditions where they want to um, use it to approach that. Uh, so it's it's a really interesting uh, community. And um so we've just done two meets uh, to date. You know, I'll, I'll organize more. Um, but, you know, it's just uh, just a place for people to connect and get together and share their stories. And and also, like, you know, um, but basically, you know, talk about keto in a safe environment where people are not going to tell them to Go eat a more carbs. balanced diet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, like, I think it's fine to be in moderation, you know, where they're not going to get pushed back for their extreme uh, high-fat diet. And also, I find that with keto, especially at the beginning of that journey, people are very focused on how much fat should I be eating? Is it okay yeah. if I do this? What if I do that? It, well, you know, if I do that, will that take me out of ketosis? There's a lot of questions to be asked. Absolutely. Which yeah. tend and, to uh, be 
What, what do you answer to this? Because, like, I take a very simplistic approach to this. Uh, you know, I, I think people get really caught up in the details, and I feel like it's going to – they're going to they're gonna find it too much, and they're going to just stop it because they're going to drop out because they're finding it too complicated. Um, you know, but I get lots of questions about the macros – um, and the things like that. And I, I give a simplistic answer. I don't, I just tell them basically to eat lots of vegetables where, you know, not so much the root vegetables, lots of greens, all of that, um, to eat meat once a day. And I like have a good piece of meat in the evening and then and to add fat to each meal and potentially skip breakfast. And in most cases, I think that's a good start, you know, mm. um, after cutting the carbs out. So I don't, I don't know what you do, but I, you know, I've just started trying to give this like much simpler idea rather than get caught up in all the details. I, I I will try and educate anyone on the fact that don't get it into your head that you need to eat lots of fat. Mm. That's not the purpose of it. Okay, if you're looking at it from a, a weight loss perspective, which is why most most people come into it initially, you know, there are the ones you say, like you say, with who want nutritional ketosis, they're not normally looking for weight loss, they're looking for cognitive improvement with Alzheimer's or, you know, reduction of tumors and cancer and stuff like that but the ones that are doing it for weight loss because it is so prevalent now everyone's talking about it um we try and educate them one it's not about eating fat to burn fat it's about changing the fuel source that your body works on if you put any fuel into your body that it's able to use for energy it will not have to burn body fat so we need to moderate what goes in and we want to change it from carbohydrate because that makes you quite hungry and gives you lots of blood sugar spikes up and down energy is a bit rubbish when you do it and move it to fat because that allows you to stabilize your blood sugar levels give you better energy makes you feel fuller for longer okay anyone tells you protein makes you feel fuller for longer i think would lie to you about other things as well because it doesn't it does just do you burn it? You do what you do, and that's it. Well, I, yeah, I, I think I think neither of us has protein in the morning. I, I eat it once a day. You yeah. know, my evening meal is basically it. I don't I don't feel hungry because of my lack of protein. Yeah, and so if you if you look at right, fats now going to be our fuel source. Then we still have to be aware that if we have too much of it, we're not allowing our body the opportunity to burn its own fat. So moderate amounts of overall intake whether it be uh, fat or um, protein so always start with fat for your meal moderate amount of protein loads and loads of vegetables as many as you can get in you which will again be very satiating and then after three or four weeks let's start looking maybe more at the at the finer detail because by then any systemic inflammation would have come down you would have dropped the water weight that you will inevitably drop. If you are still training and you're looking for performance, then I might put some carbohydrate in pre and post workout, but small amounts, 10, 15 grams, nothing exciting that's going to make your life terrible. Understand that you don't need to be in ketosis 24 hours a day, seven days a week to benefit from it. And take the the minutia out of it. Don't be so detail driven that if I have that two grams of coconut oil that means you know it's took me over my limit for the day and what's going to happen because once you've done it for a while and it does take a few months but once you've done it for a while you can pretty much tell before you do your blood sugar or ketone level where you are right, right? you have a feeling that you know well i'm about 1.5 or my blood sugar is about 4.2 because i know that feeling yeah, it's a Cause feeling. Because yeah. I've not eaten for mm. 12 hours or 16 hours or whatever it is. There, there comes a point where you get intuitive to it. And then all the minutia is irrelevant because you know full well if you eat and how you eat will make you feel a certain way. But it takes a while to get there. It's an educational process. But I know people dive in with both feet and go, right, how much fat? You know, I have to have 80% fat. Where do I get it from? Everyone wants me to eat eggs. One of the things that I tell people, no eggs, no dairy. Mm -hmm. Try doing that for keto when you search online because every breakfast is going to be heavy eggs. There's going to be uh, cream, butter, Absolutely. all the rest of it, yeah, cheese. Yeah. None of that, in my opinion, is, is beneficial. Um, 
a lot of people are intolerant to eggs and they don't realize it when we take them out they get great health benefits from it but um so so focusing on you know reasonable amounts of protein from good sources good fat sources avocado uh, c8 for sure because it's a great great addition with a lot of different benefits um some seeds nut butters i tend to use um and then lots of veg and it, you kind of all sits well it, where it should be it doesn't you don't need to drive yourself crazy over it what i've also found and you can make a comment on this there are when it comes to weight loss this has worked very well for a lot of people they'll do a ketogenic diet where their calories for argument's sake are 2000 calories a day <clears throat> and they've got a high fat ratio and they're very happy on it and they function well but the weight loss stops yeah so i've got some people to change their their protein source from a from a high fat protein source to a much leaner one so yeah. take out things like lamb and beef and salmon and use things like tuna uh, chicken breast maybe turkey that kind of thing just for some of the meals per week and what it's what it's doing basically is taking the fat down so your your macronutrient ratio is different i understand that the fat is still pretty high it's still over 50 percent but you're naturally bringing in a slightly higher calorie deficit because you're taking out some of the fat yeah you still got the same volume of food but you've not increased that volume by using carbohydrate so you just change the source of the of the protein. And a lot of people find that works pretty well. If you take it to an extreme, you've got this thing called um, uh, protein sparing modified fast, which is much, much further down the road where they take out all the uh, fat and the carbohydrate, which is not a good place to be. But if you just slightly reduce that fat um, ratio just for a few days or maybe two or three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you just have slightly less of it. You yeah. bring in that calorie deficit again just to get the the fat burning again, and then you can titrate it back up. And I found that works pretty well. I don't know if you've used or, or looked at it. I haven't. That sounds like a nice little hack. Um, definitely to test. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I think is you know, interesting to look at is sleep. Oh, um, mate, it's absolutely yeah. the most important thing. Yeah, and it's also the thing we all avoid. Yeah. <laughs> so I had someone on last week. Um, talking about sleep, and he's a performance sleep coach, mm. and a lot of uh, athletes used him, and he's been all around the world with some very big football clubs and Team Sky and all the rest of it. And he had some interesting things to say. One of the one of the things was that you don't need eight hours sleep. That's all nonsense. Yeah. Well, maybe. And uh, he, you know, napping during the day worked really well for a lot of people. Um, and it, like you know, everyone's different. I noticed something changed in my bedroom that caused me sleep uh, caused my sleep to be really bad and um and it was just the change of the quilt so when winter came a few months back my missus said right we need a new quilt this one's too light i want a heavier one i want to be tucked up and snug in bed yeah. so we went and bought this quilt which was 13 and a half tog which is pretty heavy and from the day we got it my sleep was shocking interesting is that the because temperature the you think? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Just the heat of it. Just um and uh so that we still have it and my sleep is still not great because of it. Uh, it's improved slightly, but it's not where it was beforehand. Mm. And now that the spring has decided to sp sprung, um I'm gonna change that now and get a much, much lighter um quilt and see if that reverts back to where it was. And if it does, mm. then uh, that won't be going anywhere. Yeah. you'll have to put on another jumper or uh, a hot water bottle. Right, because, you're going to have to make a, the, a new modification. Yeah, the quality yeah. of the sleep is just... It's, and just stupid little things like that can make a difference, I think. It, it is these little things. The, the only two things I was telling you earlier I've seen, and you know, I'm using this Aura uh, ring yeah. as the, the kind of proxy data, and I do find it, it helps and it, it fits with my, my personal experience of sleep, um, is having a meal too late. Uh, definitely interrupts uh, the sleep process sometimes i just get lower quality sleep tend to wake up earlier and then uh, the other thing is just getting to bed at an earlier hour mm. and i'm trying to you know always get to bed at 10 which <laughs> sounds sounds ludicrous to an old me who used to stay up till one o'clock in the morning all the time 
Um, but you know, th that's definitely what works. And I notice the difference and the ring notices the difference anytime that I get to sleep a bit later than that, even if it's just 11 o'clock, it, it makes a dent. And so over time I've managed to get this nice, you know, sleep score because it scores you and everything, um, by staying more consistent with that. I've played around with the cold, you know, the cold showers. Yeah. I'm doing those at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure that I mean, I'm I'm seeing some positive things, but I don't know. It's it's way too early to to know if I'm I'm getting any benefits from that. But it's that's one of the things I'm also playing around with cold showers. Have you have you looked at going to bed at ten, but then getting up at four or five o'clock? Well, I naturally wake up. If I go to bed at ten, I wake up at five. Right. Typically, so I'm getting seven hours. You know, uh, I don't think I need more more than that. Personally, I feel good yeah. uh, on it. Um, and I think you just don't want an alarm clock. You just want to wake up naturally hmm. um but what seems to happen with me if i go to bed later i'm still going to get up at 5 30 or something i'm just an, an early riser yeah um, i tend to have the same thing if i go to bed early i will i'll always wake up before an alarm mm. and um the, I, I use the alarm you know that that senses when you're starting to move right it comes in at the right yep. part of your sleep cycle i tend never to hear it um unless i have to get up very early um and the, the the data I was sharing this on the last show. The data that I've got at the moment was something like three hundred, sorry, thirteen hundred and fifty one nights of data, um, seven hours eleven minutes sleep, on average. Hmm. And there are definitely times where I still feel as though I need some sleep. Right. So whilst it's been consistent and it's quite you know a fairly long period of time, the quality of that sleep changes as we know, for lots of different reasons. And uh, it's all well and good saying, oh, I'll get seven hours, I'll get eight yeah. hours a night. But, you know, it, it, it's definitely... Not. And I never get up to go to the toilet, ever. Right. Um, that stopped about 10 years ago when someone said to me, you don't need to get up and go to the toilet. Just go back to... Turn over and go back to sleep. And right. I did. And, I've, you know, you've never had to go since. So, um, yeah, it's another huge thing that we could talk about for hours. But um, I'm, I'm sure we've both got much more pressing things to do today um listen mate really good to get you back on Thank if you. anyone is listening and they want that c8 come to my site or go um directly to uh, damien's doesn't really matter it's a really good product i use it and i suggest people at least experiment with it it's not expensive what, what's a, a 500 mil bottle now so uh, eighty. Uh, oh, so on on the website it's 1569 or something like that on on amazon some people like to order on Amazon because you've got Amazon Prime already. Uh, it's about 18. Uh, it's, it's higher price because there's you know, quite a whack of commissions from Amazon on there. Um, so, yeah, it might be cheapest on the site, but it depends if you've got Prime and how much you're ordering and so on. Yeah. And um, what I'll also do in the show notes is well, I've got a, a code that people can use and get free delivery. Um, so by all means, you can use that. It'll all be there. Check it out. Um, but it, what the point I'm getting at is it's not expensive. Right, you know, people will spend more than that on, you know, two two beers if you're in a bar in the West End. Yeah. So, um, it's a real good thing to try. That's not expensive, and uh, can can really bring some great benefits. So, more people that use it better, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely, and with you know, with that free shipping code, um, that's the best deal you're going to get as well. Yeah, fact, yeah, that is the cheapest you can get it anywhere, apparently. So yeah, you have to come exactly. to me. All right. <laughs> well, mate, listen, I'll let you get on. Thank you so much for today. And um, I look forward to the bars and then getting you back on and talking about that and, and how that uh, experiment works. Cool. I'll probably drag my heels for a while. As well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next year. Here we go. All right. All right, All right you, man. Thanks. All the best. Cheers, mate. Bye.